Now, why don't you make like a tree and get out of here? It's leave, you idiot. Make like a tree and leave. Stellaris Patch 3.9 is bringing a host of changes to the different species packs. In this video, we're going to look at the changes coming to the Plantoid Species Pack, which includes a new trait, a new origin, as well as some updates to a Plantoids adjacent civic. We're going to be looking at some Plantoids artwork, and then later on, I will put chapters in so you can skip ahead if you don't want to hear more about what is happening with Plantoids, but later on we're going to find out more about new Enclave leaders. They're getting new traits, new councillor positions, and new impacts on our empire. Let's dive in and find out what's going on. First up in the plantoids and plant related changes, we have a civic which is entirely not from the plantoids DLC that's going to be getting some improvements. I am talking about the environmentalist civic. Although the initial version of the ranger lodge and the ranger jobs for this civic were good, the devs felt that they could be improved upon changes this civic has seen so far. So the number of ranger jobs by the lodge now scales with the number of natural blockers on the planet, meaning the more natural blockers you have, not only will you be getting some unity from that ranger lodge, you'll also be getting more ranger jobs for more output. Environmentalist empires can also choose to expand their nature preserves, increasing the number of blockers and thus the ranger jobs on a planet. Bit of an interesting choice, uh, gameplay-wise. Let's look at some of the new images and see what these changes are going to roughly look like. Expanding nature reserves is going to cost you some minerals, and then you will get the nature preserve blocker. That will be taking away one of our maximum districts, but producing some unity, of course, because we are environmentalists and we have a ranger lodge on the planet. Does this improve the environmentalist civic though? Well, it definitely makes it more flavorful, but reducing your max district size, getting more tile blockers is generally not positive. That's going to reduce your logistic pop growth. And on top of that, it will reduce the number of districts you can put on the planet. However, early game, if you have some very large planets, this could be useful for some unity rushing as well as the fact that rangers do produce amenities and a small amount of society research. There are more bonuses coming, however. In addition to producing unity for environmentalists, each nature blocker on the planet, with the exception of the nature preserves, now gives ranger jobs a small amount of production of basic resources. This is quite interesting. So if you find some planets which have lots and lots of tile blockers on as an environmentalist, you could decide instead of building districts up in the early game, you're instead going to put out ranger lodges, getting lots of those environmentalists out and hopefully lots of things like minerals, energy credits, food, etc. So here we can see impassable mountains will be not only producing unity, but also plus one minerals from ranger jobs volcanoes producing energy credits from rangers and dense jungles producing a very small amount of food. Overall, these numbers don't make it very powerful. They don't make it game breaking. They're a nice minor addition that kind of makes environmentalists more playable. Definitely not putting it up there, you know, in the A or S tier in terms of civics as far as this goes, but it is nice to see changes like this coming into the game. Next up, we have the new trait that's going to be coming, I believe, with the Plantoids DLC. Unlike the environmentalist changes, this is, I'm pretty sure, only available if you grab Plantoids. Invasive species is really kind of bonkers. Gardeners everywhere know the threat of an invasive species. Now you too can have a Plantoid or Fungoid species that grows like weeds. Invasive species will be costing two points, and it's got some very strange mechanics that I think are really cool. So, rapid reproduction, high dispersal ability, zero useful capabilities. You can only select negative or botanical traits, meaning you can pair this, I believe, with the budding trait. And if you do, I think this could actually be very powerful for early game growth with a hive mind. Oh my goodness me. But you will get... 5% habitability and 5% pop growth speed for each negative trait you select. Because at the start of the game you can only get 5 traits, that means if you take five or 4 other negative traits and invasive species, 
you could have 20% habitability and 20% pop growth. I suspect it might be a little better to go with invasive species and budding, so you have 15% habitability and 15% pop growth, as well as 0.02 pop assembly per pop you have. That could be quite powerful, but overall you are going to struggle with the negative traits. You'll have to choose wisely and choose negative traits that may not impact your particular playstyle too much. Of course, unruly is probably a given here, but there are going to be some other difficult choices you have to make to maximize this trait. You can use it to propagate yourself across the galaxy, or more pleasantly, make that xenophile regret signing a migration pact. Definitely this also has use if you go for a necrophage origin where you can stack a whole bunch of crappy uh, negative traits on your pre patent species because you don't care about things like leader lifespan, leader experience gain, any of those sorts of things and you could end up with great pop assembly and pop growth from a pre patent that needs to have good assembly and pop growth whilst also getting bonus to your habitability Wow, this could be very powerful in the right places in the game. I'm, I'm quite excited by it. We are also getting a brand new origin for Plantoids that is similar but definitely very different to the Cordyceptics hive mine. Cordyceptics is something that comes with the Necroid species pack and that basically lets your hives subvert space fauna. Fruitful Partnership allows you to take advantage of Space Fauna in a much more advantageous way for both of you that doesn't result in the Space Fauna having to die and becoming resurrected slash entirely infested with your disgusting bits. And if you're enjoying this video, please make a Fruitful Partnership with that like button. Let's start with the thematic text, the blurb on this origin, because that will explain quite a bit and then we'll go into the specific game mechanics. If your roots run deep, yet your spirit grows restless, let others carry your aches away. Let animals sniff your flowers, nourish themselves on your fruits, and bathe in the shadow of your leaves. Let them carry pollen and seeds to distant lands so that your offspring can bury their roots on foreign soil, and when the wind brings you the sound of rustling leaves, you'll know your children have found a new home. Since time immemorial, we have worked with local fauna to spread our species across Vetricius Primus, I assume that's our homeworld. So when the time came to uproot ourselves, branches reaching further skyward, it was only natural we would also connect with the fauna of the void. They chew our fruits, they graze our leaves, and they'll carry our children to distant worlds, where they will bloom and be nurtured by alien suns. Let our seeds spread, let the galaxy be our garden. This verdant civilization has developed a unique synergy with spaceborne fauna. By offering their fruits to these creatures, they entice the seed dispersers to aid their colonization efforts. You'll be able to build Fruit Gardens, which is a star-based building that will lure spaceborne fauna into your systems. That's pretty cool. Lured spaceborne fauna will carry your seed pods to other planets, allowing you to start colonies without the need for a colony ship. And you will unlock the Seed Bombing Bombardment stats. There are some requirements. You must be either Xenophile, Pacifist, or a Gestalt Consciousness. You must not be a machine, you must not be a devouring swarm, and you must either be a fungoid or a plantoid. If you take this origin, you will begin the game in contact with the Tianki and Starseed Gardens already built on your home orchard station. I think you might be able to pair this with Cordyceptics, which in and of itself would be terrifyingly powerful, except for the fact that I'm not sure if you can infect your own Cordyceptic space fauna. So if you can combine this with Cordyceptics, oh my goodness me, Fruit Gardens would allow you to lure Tianki space whales and amoeba into your systems where you could then kill them and resurrect them, thus allowing you to have much faster naval power growth than just a regular Cordyceptic civilization that has to fly out and find the Tianki. Additionally, if we start in contact with them, I wonder if this means we get to know where Tianki Vec is. 
Because if we get to find Tiana Vec, oh my goodness me, that becomes even more powerful with Cordyceptics. We would possibly lose out on the whole sea pods bit, which if we did is really bad because I don't think we get to build our own colony ships. If we can still build colony ships with this origin, however, I don't see why the playstyle for the optimum playstyle might be, instead of actually using this as intended, use it as a bait or a lure to bring in the Tianqi and then just kill them. Get the extra energy credits, get that extra economy and build your own colony ships anyway. So the first step on your path to colonization, if you're going to use this as intended, is that space fauna will turn up and they will absorb some of your seeds. So here we can see in this uh, tooltip, space fauna visiting the tier the A ate the fruits of our garden. No, uh, no euphemisms intended there, I assume. And are now carrying seed pods across the stars. So space fauna visit your system, they're lured in, then they partake in the provided fruits of your garden and carry your seed with them, your seed pods, sorry, seed pods with them as they travel the galaxy. There's no euphemisms here at all. Then we can see here a placid leviathan that gets a new special icon to show that they are carrying our seed pods. It basically means we're kind of strapping a, a, a seed thing onto them. Now they are going to act like our colony ship. I believe they will still only colonize a habitable world though if you have a star base there, I think. If not, if this just allows you to colonize a system without a star base and then gives you a star base in that system, Holy mother of God, this is much more powerful than I actually thought in my first read through. So we can see here that the seed pod can then get planted. Space Fawn have brought our seed pods to Imuthin 3 in the Imuthin system. They will lie dormant until we're ready to open them. I suppose this does imply that you can get your seed pods down on a planet where you do not have a star base, but you cannot begin the colonization process until you have a star base, maybe. However, I know there are in-game mechanics where if you control the planet and there is no star base, one will automatically be provided for you. If that is the case, if that is what's going on here, as I said before, oh boy, this is gonna be powerful. This gives the planet a special modifier, the Dormant Seed Pods modifier. Strange seeds from an entirely different ecosystem lie dormant on this planet. I wonder if that remains after someone else tries to colonize or take the planet as well. If it does, that could be very, very interesting. Following all of this, by apparently completing a special project, new life can bloom wherever it is they brought the seeds. We can see from these tooltips, these events, open seed pods on Cyplin 3. Space Fauna have brought our seed pods to Cyplin 3 by aiming a concentrated energy beam towards the planet, we can stimulate their growth turning an uninhabited rock into a verdant new colony. If we do that special project, we then get the Patience Bears Fruit event, our seed pods on bloom opened, and the newly born Vitrici have begun to dig roots. The devs have wrote here, <clears throat> it was meant to be. Oh my God. The devs have written that having your seeds carried away by space fauna can allow colonization of planets far from your home system, but you can also be a little bit more direct about seeding an enemy planet. I'm thinking, okay, we'll get on to the orbital bombardment stance you're seeing in a moment, but I'm thinking that that does imply there are going to be some mechanics here allowing us to snipe planets from distant opponents, that sort of thing, by sending out our space fauna laden with our glorious seed pots. So the orbital bombardment stance, seed bombing, what does it do? Well, seed bombing carpets the planet with hyper-fertilized seed balls, causing an exploding growth, no pun intended. There is no damage to armies, no damage to pops, interestingly, so this will not kill any pops on the planet, which is pretty good if you're trying to not kill pops, but it will do heavy damage to the planet. You will also bombard undefended planets as well, so even if there are no armies, you can keep bombarding. This will spawn blockers on the planet, and those blockers are going to be a nuisance for your opponent. These seed blockers are primarily, as I said, terrible for your opponent, but if you end up taking the planet and clearing them yourself, you'll be able to turn them into pops, similar to lithoid blockers. That is really quite cool. So you can now 
bomb a planet down to get rid of a lot of the districts, get rid of a lot of the utility from an opponent, and then if you do decide to take it, you will get a lot of utility out of it by clearing the blockers and getting a lot of your own species as pops. That seems pretty cool and pretty powerful. We've yet to see how all of these mechanics will work out in the game itself, and I'm, I'm really keen for that. That'll be coming out with patch 3.9. But overall, I think this will be a fun origin that will reward a different style of play. Now we're going on to new artwork that we're going to be getting for the Plantoids DLC. Last week, we looked at the Lithoid Theans, which are kind of humanoid uh, Lithoids. Now we're getting these really interesting humanoid Plantoids. So the Theans came from a close encounter with Earth eons ago. The new Plantoids actually start on Earth, where the devs are exploring the possibility of what if humans were plants? Naturally, empires that branched out from Earth, if you'll pardon the pun, like the Commonwealth of Man, will share your leafy heritage. Their reputation precedes them. And seeds there is spelled S-E-E-D-S. -E -E Alrighty, so the spoiler from last week showed us the birds, and for the first time ever, apparently, the devs are introducing birds. Each of these monstrous tree people seem to have their own personal pet bird that goes in their hand, on their shoulder, wherever it wants to nest. Now, apparently the devs are also pointing out, some of the devs have been pointing out that there are other birds in game already. We've got the whole avian species pack, but those aren't birds, those are avians. So it's entirely different, don't worry about it. Now we're going to look at some more things coming in 3.9, and these things are entirely unrelated to plants and plantoids. Enclave leaders are going to be coming into the game. During the development of Galactic Paragons and First Contact, the devs wanted to revisit some of the older interactions with the various enclaves scattered around the galaxy but never found the time. In this case, that includes hiring a scientist from the Curators, hiring a governor from the Trader Enclave, hiring a teacher from the Shroud Walkers, and hiring a Salvage Overseer from the Salvagers. As the development of the 3.8 hotfix patches wound down, the devs were able to get some additional code support for Empire Counselors, and then they got to work. Coming in 3.9, each of these decisions will grant recruitment of a level 5 scientist or governor, each with their own unique trait, and if you own Galactic Paragons, you will also get a unique council position that only they can be appointed to. This leader recruitment replaces the existing Shroud Walker Teacher Planetary Modifier and Salvage Overseer Empire Modifier and improves upon the leaders recruited from the Curators and Trader Enclaves. Alright, let's start by looking at the new Shroud Walker leader we can get our hands on. So, they will have the Shroud Walker Teacher trait, granting them 30 years of leader lifespan, 5% amenities on whichever planet they are governing, and plus 3 unity from Telepath. This is basically a slightly reworked version of the bonus that we were getting if we had the Teachers of the Shroud modifier on our planet. We also get a council position though, and this is quite interesting. We get a position where for every level, and don't forget they start at level 5, so we will get Chance for Psionic Research options 25%, Monthly Unity 5%, Shroud Delve cost minus 10%, and that will only go up higher. The psionic research option increase isn't actually that useful from what we've seen given the changes coming to ascension paths and how we'll be able to use agendas to guarantee the psionic research options to spawn, but the extra monthly unity and reduction in shroud delve cost is definitely nice. Moving over to the curator scientist, they will get a veteran leader trait, granting you an empire-wide effect as long as they are a counselor, of plus 15% research speed, 25% survey speed, and an increase to the chance to draw rare technologies. On top of that, you'll of course, probably, put them in the curator archivist counselor position. You must have the curator trait to take this position of course, and you will grant for every level plus 5% assist research efficiency and minus 2% researcher upkeep, meaning we start off giving a 25% bonus to assisting research and minus 10% upkeep to researchers. This will massively reduce our reliance on consumer goods when we combine it with other researcher upkeep reductions. And on top of that, we can start getting some crazy additional bonuses by having our scientists 
using the assist research action on our planet, as long as they've got the trait for collaborative or whatever it is, plus they're a high level, we're going to be looking at, you know, 40, 50, even higher percentages of bonuses to our research output at the maximum levels from just a single scientist giving a bonus to the planet. That's awesome. Next up we have the Salvager Leader, you will get Master Salvager Trait, meaning that friendly ships in your system will get monthly hull points repaired plus 2%, and when debris is scavenged or researched in a system, there is a chance to salvage ships, a 15% chance. We may only salvage military ships from other empires. That is rather nice. The monthly hull points is basically nothing. 2% monthly hull points. I, I really like that's that's years to repair a single ship. Maybe it's meant to be daily and there's a bit of a, a, a issue with a tooltip here. But that other part, getting 15% chance whenever you're doing a scavenge or research debris action and getting a new ship, that could be very, very strong indeed. Especially if you get multiple ships. The counselor trait we're going to get is Master Salvager, and that will grant Empire wide at the base level 50% resources gained from scavenging debris. So, if you want to go with a scavenging type empire, if you have the scavenger civic, this is probably something you'll want to double down on. You'll also get armor hit points in friendly systems plus 10% at the base at level 5. This can go up to plus 100% and plus. 20% if you get your Master Salvager up to level 10 and get other uh, other bonuses there as well. Moving over to the Trader Leader, you can get Zuracorp Liaison. This grants you plus two exotic gases per month. Now, if you go with some of the other uh, trading enclaves as well, you can get crystals or moats, and that will just be a base income from that leader, which means the leader is pretty much already paying for themselves right from the start. You also get a planetary effect, plus 25% exotic gases from jobs and 10% trade value. This is of course only on the planet where this uh, trader leader is a governor. The counselor role is called Trader Liaison. That's going to grant us in the beginning 10% trade value and minus 5% market fee. And when we get up to level 10, we're going to be getting 20% trade and 10% market fee reduction. If we have the galactic market and a whole bunch of other bits and pieces, I think that means we can easily reduce our market fee down to the minimum of minus 5%. Now, it's important to bear in mind that just because you've recruited these renowned leaders from enclaves, you can't expect them to sit idly by if you attack their former home. Here we can see what happens to the Shroud Enclave leader if you attack their coven. They will be very disappointed in you, so the text here, they and I quote them, You have meddled with powers you cannot possibly comprehend. Tread carefully and take what solace you can from the present, for on the path you've chosen, the future holds only pain. I, I really feel they're channeling Saruman here with the whole, You have chosen the way of pain! kind of thing going on. Um, what does it do though? Basically you'll get a minus 20% council agenda progress, so that's a big slap in the face if you're trying to finish an agenda, and you will be able to reselect a council position. Why do you need to do that? Well, Tekt or Atek, this leader, will be leaving. They'll be saying goodbye and departing from your government immediately, leaving the rest of your bureaucrats to try and pick up the pieces. We're also going to be getting some updates to Leader XP. If you like graphs, ladies and gentlemen, I have a new graph for you. So, rather than a linear progression that abruptly hits minus 100% XP, the devs are going to replace the current XP scaling for leaders with a formula that follows a curve. This means you'll get a softer, softer reduction later on. In the beginning, it's going to be slightly more unpleasant than the current numbers as of 3.8.3, but not very much. And then that will taper off and we will even, let's say you're 10 leaders over your base of six, you'll still be getting 25% uh, of the possible 100% XP. So you will still be leveling up leaders. This kind of means going over leader cap is now less important than ever before, which is basically a direct buff to any Empire builds, such as the Machine Leader build I covered recently, that massively utilizes leaders and getting your hands on an astronomically large number of them. In next week's Dev Diary, we're going to be looking at Humanoids and Necroids apparently and finding out what changes are coming to those two DLCs. 
here we can actually see what we've currently covered so far. So the only things left to look at are those items on the bottom left. We've got some traits, we've got some planetary management stuff, and what looks to be some jobs and decisions, maybe a, a tool tip from, uh, from, 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 uh, from an origin or a civic possibly. Uh, Alfrey will be giving an update on how habitats have been going, and apparently there's something about an open beta coming. If you've enjoyed this video, but you'd like to hear more about the changes coming to Stellaris in patch 3.9, especially the changes coming to the Lithoid Species Pack, click the video on screen now.